Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 15th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why the Walker Dragas campaign pitch of PFD cuts are, quote, for the children, close quote, is a smokescreen. Second, we discuss the impact on Alaska of the Supreme Court's decision late last week upholding the Dunleavy administration's position on forward funding. And third, we discuss the significant takeaways for Alaska from ConocoPhillips' second quarter earnings call. And now, let's join Michael. Weekly top three today. Now, I would have assumed uh, before you sent me all your what you wanted to talk about, I would have assumed today that it would all be about elections uh, for today. But no, we've skipped right over to let's talk about what's coming up in November. Brad's already like cast forecasting forward. Um, Bill Walker, it's for the children. Uh, that seems to be his new mantra. And uh well, Brad, tell me all about his It's for the Children uh, uh, shield that he's throwing out there in front of people to talk about right now. Well, just to explain why we're not talking about the election, we've talked about it like on the last three shows. And I thought, yeah, and, yeah, exactly. as, as Mike Shower puts it sometimes when he and I have a discussion, ad nauseum. So I thought maybe. Oh, ad nauseum, yeah. Hey, you know what? You just got to repeat and repeat and repeat until people get the message. That's what that's what you got to do. So but let's let's talk a little bit about, you know, because we really are coming down to it here. We've got, you know, Bill Walker, Les Guerra, uh, Mike Dunleavy, and then the fourth who we're hoping is going to be Charlie Pierce. But, you know, we've got Guerra and Walker. These are the two choices that I definitely personally do not want to see in the state. Bill Walker primarily because we've already seen what he's going to do. We've already we've already had a preview of upcoming, you know, of, of upcoming attractions, and it's not attractive. No, well, Walker's got this this new ad campaign out that uh, that's that's interesting. It's uh, I've I've seen it on Twitter and I've seen it on Facebook. I'm sure it's showing up other places as well. But it has uh, Jennifer Johnston uh, uh, talking over some pictures of the governor's mansion and some Walker Dragas uh, campaign uh, posters. Um, and explaining why she's supporting. Now, this is the defeated Jennifer Johnston, right? Former vice chair of the House Finance Committee and defeated right. for a reason. Right. Um, uh, talking about why she's supporting Bill Walker. And basically, the theme is one we often hear in Alaska. It's for the children. In her case, it's for her children and grandchildren. And the pitch basically is we need to save the P we need to save the permanent fund today to build it up to, as Walker puts it in his uh, campaign literature, in his, in his positions uh, uh, statement on, uh, on his website, we need to build it up to uh, 100, 100 to $120 billion, and then it will produce revenue forever that can fund government forever, and we never have to worry about uh, other sources of revenue in the state. The, the, the problem, and, and, and so it's for the children, it's for my children, it's for my grandchildren. That's why we need to sacrifice today by you know, putting as much of the permanent fund earnings back into the permanent fund as we possibly can and, and limiting PFDs. The problem with that, it's great if you're a top 20% child. It's great if you're the top 20% now, because that means that that we use the permanent fund earnings stream to, to fund government currently. Uh, the remainder of the earnings go off uh, back into the permanent fund to build it up toward this Nirvana number. Uh, permanent fund dividends are cut to do that. 
And who takes the brunt of the cut? Middle and lower income Alaska families. What children take the brunt of the cut? Middle and lower income Alaska family children. Um, so there's this promise of a nirvana out there someplace that we get to if we, you know, if we make this sacrifice now and we build up the permanent fund uh, to a point where it can fund government um, at some point, at some point out in the future. But what happens when we get to that point? The same thing. We have to, we have to continue to cut permanent fund dividends because at that point we're diverting almost all of the permanent fund earnings to support government. Uh, to, to achieve this nirvana of not having to need uh, other revenues. What children get affected, uh, what families get affected at that point, those uh, in middle and lower income Alaska families, the top 20% continue to, uh, to, to skate by. What children get affected at that point, middle and lower, the children of, of middle and lower income Alaska families. So basically this pitch of it's for the children is, is a smokescreen. It is it is for the top 20% now, and it's for the top 20% in the future. It's for the top 20% children now, and it's for the top 20% children in the future. Um, and, and, you know, in Alaska, we have these pitches all the time, and we're very susceptible to them because, you know, as Alaskans, we do worry about future generations. The Native culture teaches you to worry about, you know, generations 20 years, 20 generations down the road. Uh, we do worry about the children. But but you can't. But 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 they're 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 using that theme. It's for the children as a smokescreen to cover for just you know making the top twenty percent's life easier now by diverting PFDs to to fund government or deferring deferring PFDs to build up the the permanent fund corpus, and it's for the top twenty percent children and top twenty percent families in the future because you have to continue to cut the PFD. You have to continue to keep the PF, uh, PFD down uh, in the future. Another ad he's running is from Ivy Sponholtz. And that sort of, between Johnston and Sponholtz, you're sort of giving the game away, right? Because right. when, John, when Johnston was co-chair of, of House Finance, she was an advocate of a 2575 PFD, a deep cut in the PFD down to just 25% of earnings. Sponholtz, this last legislature, sponsored legislation, push legislation out of House Ways and Means, which she chaired, to uh, to do the same thing, to cut the PFD down to 25% of a permanent, fund, er, permanent fund earnings, and still to do that by statute, not even to put that in the Constitution, still to do that by statute so they could, can, so they... Uh oh <clears throat> So they're really, I, I mean, between those two ads, they're really... Game is cut the PFD save the top 25% from having to contribute uh, uh, materially toward the cost of government, both now and in the future, cut it down to 25, 75. And the top 20% and their children are fine. It's middle and lower income Alaska families that, uh, that take the brunt of it both now and in the future. Oh, but don't worry, Brad. Those, those lower 75%, they get all those government services. <laughs> uh, you know, they get all those government services that we provide. I mean, forget about the fact that that argument is so flawed, because even if you uh, would say that the bottom 25 percent would get a significant, it leaves the vast unwashed middle who are not uh, receiving any of those special services out in the cold. And they're the ones that are bearing the full brunt of the of uh, of paying without getting anything. Exactly. And Michael, that argument also has another big flaw. I mean, when when you talk about when you talk about these the, the programs for lower income families in other states and nationally, the burden of those programs, the cost of those programs is spread throughout, you know, whatever the, whatever the tax base is, what it, federally, whatever the, the progressive income tax gives you in states, whatever sales tax, plus some states have income taxes, whatever that base uh, gives you much, a much broader base. When you talk about doing it through PFD cuts, what you're talking about is making is making lower income families pay for their own programs, right? We're not spreading the cost th throughout the entire the entire base. We're focusing the cost on the lower income families. So basically, it's it's it, it's a program to keep the, the lower income families poor. It's not to give them a leg up as it is in other states or nationally. It's 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 basically you have to pay for your own programs, and we decide what programs you're going to have to pay for. It's a it's it's an entirely it's an entirely wrong argument to say 
yeah, we should we should cut the PFD because you know those lower income families are are, are getting benefits. That's not the way lower income programs are intended to operate. They're intended to be funded by by a broad base to help give lower income families a leg up. Here, the way we're doing it, we're we're making sure that poor income that that poor families stay poor. Right. Uh, you know, Brad, this is a rehash too, by the way, of uh, Walker's previous, uh, uh, you know, plan or or outline that he had while he was governor, where he talked about converting the permanent fund into the sovereign wealth fund. I mean, that's what this was all about. This was never about getting Alaskans the money that was actually theirs, money that was belonged to them and getting them their share of the resource wealth. This was always about and always has been about funding the government, Donna says in the chat room right now, it's actually for the unions, not for the children. It's about funding government and the employees and the base of that at the expense of the private sector. Yeah, you, you see that you see that in the legislature with Zach Fields. Zach Fields is a perfect example of that. Zach Fields is one of the biggest champions of PFD cuts. Not not because you know he thinks the top twenty five percent deserve any. Uh, deserve any special treatment, but because he's concerned, if you if you maintain the PFD and have to fund government through through broad based taxes, that the top twenty percent will push back on spending. And so what they what what his view of the world is: let's continue to fund it through PFD cuts. Uh, let's not engage the top twenty five percent. Let's not make them contribute to it, because oh my gosh, they'd actually see the cost of these things and they'd say, oh no, we don't want to fund that anymore. As long as you can make it free to the top 25% or minimal cost by, by using PF cut, PFD cuts, trivial cost by using PFD cuts, they won't engage. They won't push back. We've seen that in the legislature because Von Imhoff will never push back on spending. Von, right. Imhoff, Von Imhoff will only say we need, to, we need to cut the PFD to pay for it um, because that way you shove the cost of middle and lower income Alaska families. Don is exactly right. It 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 is it is a way, at least among the Democrats, the the cut the PFD mantra is is a way to maintain government spending on programs that we want, even though we're forcing lower and middle income Alaska families to pay for it, to pay for the programs that are supposed supposedly helping give them a leg up. They continue to do that because they want to maintain the funds flowing to government spending without top twenty percent becoming the top twenty percent becoming engaged in. Uh, in critically thinking about what uh, what the heck we're doing in this state. I think Donna's comment is pretty much nails it right down to, I'm going to come back to it again. It's actually for the unions, not the children. And uh, I think uh, I think Donna's 100% right. This exactly shows us why they care more about the government spend than about the private sector spend. It's not for the children. It's for government programs and protecting the unions and everything else. Uh, that's for sure. Yeah, uh, and, and and Zach, as I say, Zach Fields just personifies that. I mean, Zach Fields, the, the the representative of one of the poorest areas of Anchorage, uh, uh, favoring, supporting, pushing, indeed, PFD cuts uh, in order to create revenue. Uh, it just just explains everything, right? Because Zach, Zach Fields does not want the top twenty top twenty percent engaged in oversight of government spending. He just wants it to you know, come off the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families, fund government programs, government programs that even benefit the top 20% wants it to come off the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. So the top 20% will never, ever, ever get involved in oversight of, uh, of what's being spent. And, and, and with that, I mean, because that's the donor class with that, just government just runs amok as we've seen. Right. Exactly. Going back here. 24.5% of Alaskans are under 18. Can you get much lower income than that? I mean, I think that was Brad's point, uh, Paul, is that the under 18 crowd are the ones that are definitely, I mean, they're paying for it, not just at the state level, but at the federal level and everything else. It's the future generations, the younger and the future generations, Brad, who are going to pay for all this fantastic government that we have right now. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, the middle and lower income Alaska, children of middle and lower income Alaska families now, children of lower middle and lower income Alaska families in the future. It's, I mean, I, you, you, you gotta, I guess, admire Walker for trying to, you know, trying to blow his way through this by, you know, using the it's for the children uh, mantra, but it's just, it's, it's dishonest. I mean, it's not for the children. It's for certain children, certain privileged children, 
children of the of of the top twenty five percent top twenty percent income bracket. Uh, right, and uh, and it's just uh, it's a uh, it, it it is a misleading and in duplicitous and and dishonest uh, uh, yeah. theme that he's trying to push. Absolutely. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, we're talking about the weekly top three, just finishing up with Bill Walker's It's for the Children mantra. Uh, and that uh, that leads us uh, that leads us on to our second one, which is the new clarity that we just got from the courts. Give us a quick tease, Brad, and we'll come back to it here after the break. Well, the Dunleavy administration is often mocked for filing lawsuits and not winning. This one, they won. Uh, and it's provided some clarity, I think, that we that's that's useful uh, around fiscal policy and what legislatures can and cannot do. Up until now, we've been experiencing sort of legislatures run amok, cutting the PFD without government without gubernatorial oversight, uh, stuffing money away in various pots without uh, without much government gubernatorial oversight, uh, and this puts some uh, constraints on what the legislature can do. So I think it's worth uh, talking about as we talk about fiscal policy. Yeah, no, I mean, I think this is a big victory, and uh, I can't wait to get into the weeds on it and talk a little bit more about it. We're continuing now. Brad Keithley, our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three. We're on to number two, which has to do with this uh, recent case that just came out uh, day before yesterday, uh, talking about how the legislature can no longer um, forward fund different things. They've been doing this for a while as an end run around both the governor and future legislatures. And finally, the courts uh, kind of smacked them down and said, no, Brad, let's uh, let's talk about this. Well, this case arises out of an action the legislature took in 2018 before the election of Governor Dunleavy. Uh, what that legislature did was not only fund then your uh, current K-12 through education, but they also appropriated money for uh, the following year, uh, uh, K through 12, uh, and set and set the uh, set it at a certain amount. When Governor Dunleavy came in, his proposal was to reduce the funding to K through 12 uh, in in the first in his first budget in the in the 2019 or in the 2020 that would be the 2020 budget, 20 elected 2019 but yeah 2020 budget. He, he his proposal came in to his proposal was to reduce spending um, in that budget. And uh, the legislature said, you can't do that because we've already appropriated it. Uh, you can't backward veto, essentially, something that we've already appropriated. And, and while the new legislature could reduce it by reappropriating funds, uh, because it was still controlled by uh, the coalition, uh, they, weren't, they weren't about to agree to reduce the appropriation they had, they had made. So, Governor Dunle so this matter went to court. Uh, Governor Dunleavy at first said, uh, Kevin, or Clark, Kevin Clarkson, who was then the Attorney General, first said, uh, there's no appropriation because, the, because you can't do the carryover appropriations the legislature tried, and, and you haven't done a new appropriation. There's no appropriation. There's no funding for, for schools. That caused, obviously, a lot of consternation. And so the, the settlement that they reached at that point was the governor would agree to uh, spend, would agree to the appropriation that the legislature had made in 2018. Um, uh, but he, but the case would continue. This is that ultimate case now being decided by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said the 28 le 2018 legislature couldn't do what it tried to do because it didn't have the funds. It didn't have the funds in hand. There wasn't enough of a surplus that year, if you will, against other funding. There wasn't enough of a surplus to be able to actually set aside actual funds uh, that, that the state was going to receive during the appropriation year uh, to, to forward fund uh, uh, the following year. Um, and so the legislature's action was inappropriate. Now, because there had been a settlement uh, between the Dunleavy administration and the legislature when the suit was going on, there's no immediate consequence of that going backward. There's no defunding of, of K-12 through going backwards. But going forward, it does tell the legislature, future legislatures, that you can't uh, you can't uh, essentially uh, take a shot in the dark and appropriate what, appropriate what you think are going to be funds available in future years. You can use the funds you have in the year in which you're doing the appropriation, but you can't you can't uh, make up dummy appropriations essentially of what of what you think is going to be received uh, in future years. 
So this past year, this 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 is an example of of the other side of this. This past year, because of the surge in oil prices, the the legislature had more revenues than it made current appropriations for, and one and so one of the appropriations it made was to forward fund K through twelve funding next year. Right. The 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 court's ruling essentially says you can do that because you've got the funds in hand this year. You can spend those funds because they're coming in in the current appropriation year, you can spend those funds any way you want to. You can make capital appropriations, you can put them into savings, you can forward fund, you can use them for supplemental funding as the, as the, as the legislature in fact did uh, uh, for, the, for the prior fiscal year. Um, and, and so that's okay because you have the funds in hand that year. Now that doesn't mean that that necessarily ties future legislatures in in any given appropriations year the legislature can make reappropriations of funds that have been previously authorized for other things. Right. And so if so, a new legislature comes in this year uh, and you know we change a bunch of the players out, they can actually go back to that one billion dollar forward funding and said, well, that was a nice idea, but we need the money to be doing other things, and so they can reappropriate it at that point. Well, I mean, and and I'll be honest with you, some of the most interesting things that were out in in this decision that came from the Supreme Court. Remember, this has already gone to Superior Court, and the Superior Court backed the legislature, but the Supreme Court said, in a plain reading of this, it's very clear what the framers' intent was: is that it would be an annual budget process. They would not be binding over other legislators and and making this, it was really a plain reading of the Constitution, which I found pleasantly surprising. Well, it's the same plain reading, frankly, that they used in the permanent fund dividend decision. They said there that 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 one legislature can't bind another, that you can't essentially have done advance appropriations, dedicated funds by statute. You can do it by Constitution, but you can't do it by statute. So essentially, it's the same theme that we see showing up now in this decision. One legislature can't bind future legislatures uh, by making uh, dummy appropriations that uh, uh, set aside funds that this legislature doesn't doesn't yet have. I mean, essentially, this 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 finding could have said you could have you could have made you could have forward funded the permanent fund dividend from the sur surpluses you had this year. It right. would not be inconsistent with the court's 27 to 2017 decision on the permanent fund dividend by saying this legislature, this this, this decision says this legislature could have uh, advanced funded, pre-funded, forward funded the permanent fund dividend next year uh, by using some of the surplus funds uh, it had it had this year. So it is it is a theme that we that 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 is consistent with what the with what the court found in 2017, but now it's sort of coming back to haunt if you will, the other side, the, the K through 12, the education side and other, right. uh, other sides that, uh, that depend on government funding. It's like, oh no. I mean, what the 2018 legislature was, was trying to do was hedge their bets, right? If, um, if Walker lost, they still wanted to have K through 20, K through 12 funding, uh, uh locked in. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. I mean, I think this is good because, again, it it shows and separates out the both the administrative and the legislative power. It shows what they can do. We'll have to uh, we'll have to we'll have to keep an eye out on what the what goes on with that. But that leads us down to the last four minutes here or so, which leads us to number three, which is a dissection of the second quarter earnings report. From ConocoPhillips. Now we hear a lot about this. The oil companies are making tons of money. They're doing in Alaska and everything else, and we should be getting our fair share. What does it tell you, Brad, as a former oil and gas consultant and attorney? What does it tell you as you look at the Q2 Conoco report uh, of the state of oil and gas in Alaska? What does it mean for us? Well, there's two things I think that that come out of the of the second quarter earnings report. One is Conoco reaffirmed that they're committed to the Willow project. If, and the if with a big if, and the big if is if the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, the federal government, uh, approves uh, the scoped down, uh, uh, they agree to, and, and, it will, and if the federal government approves the scoped down uh, alternative that the federal government included in their supplemental uh, environmental impact statement. But the big if is if the federal government approves that, frankly, with no further conditions. 
what 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 Conoco used the term Conoco used was a strong record of decision. If the government comes out with a strong record of decision that supports the alternative, then great. It looks like we're going forward. But what they're what they're really raising in subtext is if you put a bunch of conditions on that alternative, that alternative scoped down from what we wanted, we can live with it. But if you put a bunch of conditions on that alternative, we're not sure we're we're not sure we're going forward. And so we're going to wait to make the commitment, the financial commitment of going forward until we see uh, until we see that record of decision. So we're we're still sitting out there. That's one thing from the 2Q report. The second thing, Conoco spent a long time talking about their positioning in the LNG market, the liquefied natural gas market, and how they're making investments both in the U.S., in Mexico, in an export terminal being built in Mexico, and in an export terminal being built in Qatar, in the Middle East. Uh, they, they spent a long time talking about uh, their, their, their belief in and their commitment to LNG projects. Well, huh, they've got a lot of gas sitting up here on the North Slope. And and the and and the two companies that have that have been that were historically committed to the LNG project were Exxon and BP. Conoco was always sort of hesitant about its role in the LNG project, and they didn't even bother mentioning the Alaska position uh, when they were talking about LNG. I think what that tells us is 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 additional confirmation that the Alaska LNG project is very marginal. Um, uh, the economics of it don't work very well. Um, and that it, at least even in today's world where LNG is having a big boost and the LNG uh, market is becoming robust, that the Alaska project doesn't have doesn't have a place in it. The, the absence of, of talking about Alaska in, in this extended the discussion they had on LNG generally tells us a lot about what they think about uh, the, uh, an Alaska LNG project. Today's election day. So your final thoughts as we wrap things up for the show today. Uh, Charlie Pierce, uh, we've talked on the previous show how important fourth place is uh, uh, in the governor's race, how critical fourth place could be in the governor's race. Uh, and we've talked about the concern I have about, you know, whether the Kirka voters would would just be bullet voters and not mark a second preference on their on their ballots. Pierce voters, I think, are much more inclined to vote for a second preference for uh, for Dunleavy, if that's sort of where we end up. Um, and uh, and I think it's critical that Charlie Pierce be elected uh, uh, be have that fourth spot uh, in the in the runoff for uh, for the governor's race. So it, I'm going to vote Pierce and I encourage anybody else who's still undecided out there to vote Pierce. Yeah, no, I mean, I think at this point, I think Charlie's still the best candidate, uh, regardless of even. But if we're thinking about uh, if we're thinking about, uh, you know, kind of strategically what needs to come out of the ranked choice thing in the bottom line, I would rather have even a Dunleavy over Guerra or Walker at this point. So. Uh, Pierce for the primary, and then Pierce and Dunleavy when you're ranking the red in the fall. I'd like to get your comments on the whole Gail Fanumi thing where she said, we did a great job. I mean, let's pat ourselves on the back for what a great job we did at educating Alaskans uh, for what's going on. Well, I, I read as much as I possibly could read out there, um, not only from the state, but also from uh, uh, various other sources that were analyzing how to how the ranked choice election was going to run and, you know, vote, give preferences on one side of the ballot and single. And then I finally got the ballot in front of me, right? Uh, I'm voting absentee. So uh, uh, I, I finally got the, the ballot in front of me. And I sat there and I just scratched my head. And, All right, I'm supposed to do this over here and this over here. And I want to make sure Charlie Pierce finishes fourth, but to make sure he finishes fourth, I got to vote for him in the, as a, as a single point. And it was, um, it, it was an experience. I don't know if you've, if you've early voted there, but, uh, it was an experience to actually go through the process. I, I, I wonder, you know, for those people who are going to line up like they usually do on election day and go through the, go through the process. I wonder if this, if it's going to take longer, uh, with people going into oh, the booth yeah. and sort of, I would sort imagine. Of yeah, I imagine so. I mean, I, and I've talked to several people who are election volunteers and they were, really not looking forward to this because they're saying that they knew that there was going to be a lot of confusion going on and people who were going to be agitated and angry and probably a lot of ballots that were going to be destroyed and have to be redone because people didn't understand it. And it's just, it's going to be a poo parade. Well, and, and the other thing that's come out from Fanumi, that, that, I mean, I understand why 
but it's still a little aggravating. We're not going to know the 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 winner unless somebody gets fifty percent today. Unless somebody has fifty percent at the end right. of voting today right. in the in the congressional race in the in the special election race. Unless somebody have 50, has fifty percent uh, at the end of the day today, we're not going to know who wins that race for another two weeks. Right. Because because they're not going to they're not going to count the second preference ballots. Uh, if if nobody gets fifty percent, you go to the second preference ballots of the of the person finishing last. They're not going to count the second preference ballot ballots until the end of the time, until the end of the month, when all of the ballots uh, are supposed to be in. When all the ballots that are in will be the ones that are counted. Anything received after that date will be discarded. Um, and so we're not. They're not going to count those. They're not, not going to count the second preference until until we get to that point. So we won't know what, what we'll probably know at the end of the day, if you b- believe the pollsters is Mary Peltola is ahead, uh, either Palin or Begich is in second and the other one's in third. We will think we know that whoever is in second, whichever of the two Republicans is in second, will probably win because the second preference ballots of the, of the third person will likely go mostly to the other Republican and will likely push the other Republican above. We will think that, but we won't know that. And we won't have right. a representative uh, for another, for another two weeks. We won't have the results. So think what that means. Think what that means in the governor's race. When we get there in, uh, um, in, uh, in November, it, we, that it means we won't know who the governor is until late November. Yeah. That's what I was just going to say. Extrapolate that out till November. That means that we won't even know till what, the 21st, 24th of November, who the governor is actually going to be, and then they have to produce a budget 12, 15 days later. Um, I mean, it, wow. That's all I could say is, wow. It's going to be a real crazy time. Let's put it that way as we come as we come close to this. It, it, and, it is, and, and, and especially if Kirk is in fourth. I mean, that I, I get back to, I go back to a theme here. Especially if Kirk is in fourth, there's going to be a lot of let's let's say Dunleavy has forty seven percent, forty five percent, and and Guerra and Walker have split the have split their vote evenly, and so you got you got Kirk or you got uh, uh, Pierce in fourth. There's going to be a lot of speculation about if Kirk especially uh, is is finished in fourth about whether his voters were bullet voters, whether they whether they marked a second preference or not, because if they didn't. And they and that Dunleavy doesn't get over the top um, uh, as a result of the failure of the second preference. Then you're gonna you're gonna let either Walker or Guerra, who's ever finished third, uh, decide the race. And that and we're not likely gonna like that race. So we're we're just gonna November is gonna be a very interesting month as we sort of you know wait around for right. uh, twiddle our thumbs waiting for the results. I'm gonna be waiting for the reaction over the next two weeks. You're gonna see the reaction from the primary. Uh, from what people had to do with the two types of voting and everything else. And I think that that will be very telling on what the post November 8th uh, feel is going to be. And I will be surprised, like I said earlier, if for some reason we don't end up with a, uh, with a, with a move to repeal ballot measure number two, uh, when it's all said and done, that's just my take on it. Well, there's going to be, there's going to be those who, uh, who will have a basis for thinking that because it's it's not going to be like elections that we're normally used to, where we wait around on election. I mean, Landfield's going to have an election night special, right? He's going to have guests in. They're going to talk about the election. What's to talk about? <laughs> I mean, the real election night special is going to be two weeks later when the second preference ballots come in. Right. So we just, don't know a thing. Right. Exactly. It's just going to be all sorts of speculation on the on the special night. Nice to watch, fun to watch, but but there's it's just going to be all sorts of speculation. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, Brad, as always, we appreciate you coming on board, sharing your thoughts with us. Um, And uh, we look forward to talking next week. We'll have a little bit more information on the election. We won't have the answers, but we'll have some of them anyway. And uh, and I hope we can uh, we'll have some good discussions then. Thank you so much for coming on board. Michael, always good to have uh, always good to be on. And once one last time, happy birthday. Thank you, my friend. I really appreciate it. We're all getting older, unfortunately. That seems to be the theme around here. Brad Keithley, thank you, sir. Appreciate you coming on board. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. 
We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Topic.